I'm Marius Keller from the International Institute for Sustainable Development. Thanks very much for these three very good presentations. I've, my question goes into the direction of the repackaging. And since we sort of are here in the context of the climate change conference, it's about climate change. So it was briefly, I think, mentioned in the last presentation. Um, climate change as a sort of context factor, and I'm sure that uh, many of the, the solutions you presented are climate change measures. But the question would be whether you actually have, in some of your projects, looked at what climate change specifically means for your context, <clears throat> and whether it actually means that some of the activities would have to be changed. So can you just do whatever you propose and it will just work the same way under climate change? Or does it mean that we have to do certain things differently? Thank you. I'm Mariana Rufino from uh, C4, the Center for International Forestry Research. Um, we are working for the climate change program. Um, many of the things that you have done in the past, in the last 10, 15 years, are the things that are needed to work with climate change. But the question is, when you want to do development programs, who is funding now a 10, 20 years implementation program, where projects are at best three, four years, and we have to live with it and deal with climate change. Thank you. My name is Jan Peters from Michael Suche Foundation. My question is, in times of climate change, we already see the climate changing, especially in these dry areas. We, we see um, the changing rainfall patterns or droughts or flash floods and uh, stuff like this. And uh, Do you also take um, kind of um, regional projections for climate change into account. Do you use such tools to, to kind of prove if the investment, if the measure of these, these projects will also last for 10, 15, 20 years more to the future? Uh, Bastian Raumann from Kati in Costa Rica. We've seen a lot of uh, basically biophysical improvements, uh, changes in, in practices. Uh, in any of the three cases, do you also have uh, changes in the socioeconomic structure of the landscapes or territories, maybe better in that case? Okay, with regard to the repackaging or the old wine in new skins, I think it's basically a question of emphasis. Watershed development, if understood classically, in which the communities are the center, which means the following, a rich to valley approach, an approach that takes into consideration the land capability when determining uh, activities to be undertaken. When you keep in mind the, the use pattern, the land use pattern of the community and the way they depend upon environmental services, and when the focus is to stabilize and increase environmental services, then basically what you're talking about is actually landscape management. So watershed development, if done in a comprehensive manner and in a holistic manner, which is community-led, is actually, in my submission, uh, landscape management. Now, therefore, you know, as time, as time passes, words come to mean different things. And some words that were understood in a particular context to import a particular meaning, over time loses its power and new words come in. So to that extent, yes. I mean, it, if you may say, it's not so much repackaging as a recommunication of a concept that was always there. It's a question of emphasis also. Now, it also, it's not just repackaging. You see, the same word itself acquires different meanings over time in response to emerging and evolving situations. Like, for instance, in climate change context, it's not enough to talk only of watershed development. It's also important to emphasize that particular aspect of watershed development, which could best address the issue of vulnerabilities that arise due to climate change adaptation. So in time, even landscape, that word itself may lose its importance, and another, another component of watershed development would probably gain prominence, because that would be then addressing more specifically that particular need that is arising as a result of changing factors, either climatic or environmental or social or economic. Well, I think watershed management is one of the um, well-known landscape approaches for hilly environments. And if you're working in a very flat Sahelian environment, maybe it's difficult to get convince the villagers to think about a watershed, so one tends to use the term territory um, there. What we're trying to show is that watershed management 
There's a lot of experience, and the policymakers should not start to have to reinvent the wheel. There's a lot of experience there, a lot of knowledge, and we need to draw on that for climate resilience. But in order to make a convincing case for the policymakers, we need to reassess the different technologies that are used in the watershed in terms of climate resilience and to, to demonstrate that they really are helping um, communities to uh, be more resilient and to um, obviously adapt, like uh, the genetic uh, varieties, etc is an obviously a really important part. If the rainfall becomes more erratic, it's not just through soil and water conservation. One needs to also um, think about which uh, short season crops one can in introduce into the cropping strategy, um, which livestock uh, breeds are more resilient and how, they can, how you can increase the fodder, uh, et cetera. So there's many ways. So um, I think watershed management has developed over the years and initially it was very much a natural resources um, uh, approach and I think there was a lot of learning in the 1980s and 90s that it has to be people centered and participatory and I'm sorry if we presented rather a natural resources perspective I think it's because the pictures look show the resources and it's difficult to show enough pictures about the community participation aspect. I think we all tried to present that as well. Um, and the organizations, the institutions, I think we all talked around that. Uh, so I, yeah, that's maybe some comments there. Yeah. Thank you, Sally. Dieter, one strong argument, why is the watershed management fit also appropriate to address the climate change, the adaptation to climate change issue? You have one convincing argument? Well, not, not only one, I guess, but I, I try to, to show this. I, I think you, with, with this approach, so with, with the, these techniques, and there are a lot of more of them, not only sort of hardware, there are also soft techniques that you may use, like regulations, how to use common lens, and so on. Uh, I think what, what you get, you get a stabilization, as I said, a stabilization of the production. You get even an increase of the production. And you involve the, the people, you involve all the stakeholders, which means that they, they are much better up afterwards to react of, to all different kinds of problems. So they have conflict, conflict resolution mechanisms that they, they develop, they, they improve their negotiation capacity and so on. For, for me, these are all let's say, elements of a, a stronger resilience against climate change. So, but this is sort of the, the, the <coughs> classical approach without talking about adaptation to climate change only. So there was another question, well, did the climate adaptation debate, did this change anything in the, in the concept or in the techniques? And indeed, at least for the, Ni for the Niger example, it, it did indeed. Like for example, small utilization of irrigation potentials became a much stronger point linking to markets became a much stronger point. And also, well, this is rather technical, like the, the entire intervention zone was centered uh, around, well, fossil valleys that traditionally had a higher water level, uh, water table. So in, uh, by centering all the, 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 the treatments close to these fossil valleys, we hoped that we could sort of reestablish these fossil water tables further down, so this was not a, a rearrangement of, of the spatial uh, intervention zone. So there were concrete changes, yeah. Thank you, Dieter. Um, maybe again to you the question, quickly ask, what kind of donors, if at all, or can you name one or some of them who are ready to engage for such a long-term investment, who do not think and plan, invest in the classical project cycles of three to eight years, say. Yeah, vol voluntarily, because this is something I really would like to pit put a little bit up on the screen. I, I, I think German Develop Development Corporation, they had a big advantage in former times that projects could be planned over, let's say, at least 12, 12 years, 12 to 15 years. And they have abandoned this approach, so we are back to the project approach that uses three to five year projects. And I think it's even more so for the other donors. But I, I think this is 
exactly something that we need to change because we don't we, we don't respond to long-term problems in these countries with with, uh, with short-term projects of three to five years. That's completely inappropriate as, a, as an approach. It costs a lot of money to start these projects all the time, to close them down again, to restart them again. That's an extremely expensive type of, of implementing activity. So I, I think this, this is something that should be changed at the, at the political level. But there are also other possibilities to change this, and I think Crispino has shown one example, this is by setting up sort of multi-donor multi, multi -donor baskets. At least then you have the possibility or the, the, the potential, if one donor draws out, perhaps another one is coming in or the rest of the donors stays within this trust and, and continues to the funding. But basically, I guess such programs, they have to be hooked up into national policies. A country has to decide, well, this helps, helps the country, this stabilizes our national production, food production, so this is something that we should maintain for the next 50 years. I think that we have to be innovative and I think the public-private partnerships is probably the new way forward. How do we get the private sector to invest in these sorts of strategies that we're talking about? Because if you're putting in a hydroelectric power plant, obviously it makes sense to think about a much longer term, maybe 40 years, 30, 40 years. Um, if one's putting in incentives like payments for environmental services, one would hope that that's not just a short-term project cycle. So I think the green water credits, the um, pay payments for environmental services for biodiversity conservation and also for carbon. Now unfortunately the carbon markets are not very um, favorable at the moment, but that's certainly a way forward if we can find a way of packaging because most watershed projects actually um, generate multiple benefits, not just one of these um, advantages. And so maybe we need to be a little bit um, innovative in thinking how to package these together and to provide um, some sort of funding for watershed management um, for the achievement of these environmental benefits that have global implications. And that might be a new, interesting Jeff project. So if anyone wants to think about that further, maybe we should think about designing one and getting some funding from the Global Environmental Facility to do that. Thank you, Sally. Crispina, you had in your presentation the aspect of sustainability address, particularly. Yes. And uh, I recall that uh, you said that's something you have to think of from the very beginning, actually, and uh, to set up structures. From your side, any other kind of innovation or innovative approaches you possibly can contribute from your experience in order to sustain support for long-term, long-term support? Okay, I'll combine it with the other question also that was raised, is to what extent does watershed development actually address the issue of climate change or build adaptive capacity? Somebody had asked that. And I'll combine it also with the issue of sustainability. You see, from the practitioner's point of view, from the farmer's perspective, climate change manifests itself in two major ways. One is in terms of rainfall received and in terms of rising temperatures. Now, when you adopt a watershed approach, basically you address the issue of water substantially. Because by harvesting it across a catchment, you first I mean, ensure that you increase the number of amount of water available and you lengthen the period of its availability as well as its quantity. Okay, so in terms of hydrological flows, that's excellent. By planting trees and biomass, you also to an extent create impact microclimates. To that extent, to a very some degree, you at least affect uh, or mitigate the impacts of extreme temperature. But what watershed development per se cannot do is to address the whole issue of uh, variability, both in terms of rainfall as well as temperature, as well as in uh, erratic or extreme weather events. That's why together with watershed development or ecosystems management, you need to also uh, bring in new components. Now that comes to the second part, what, what are the new things which build, lead to sustainability? One is definitely you need to include agrometrology. Farmers need to have access to forecasts of likely weather outcomes as well as uh, action that they should take both in terms of community action as well as in terms of farming package, uh, package of practices to adapt to these extreme weather events. Like for instance, should I sow now or should I wait a week later? Or should I sow before the normal traditional day of sowing? Should I use the same crops I've been doing or should I change because likely the weather patterns and the rainfall patterns may change in the next two or three weeks. 
What type of cattle and livestock should I keep? These are fundamental decisions for farming communities. So you need to bring in livestock met agriculture, which is linked to emerging weather patterns or forecast weather patterns, number one. Number two, you need to now focus also on crop uh, water productivity. So drip irrigation, more bang for the buck in a way of more output per drop of water. These are concepts which you never thought of before. We thought of harvesting as much rainwater. Now we need to think not only of harvesting, but how to use it most productively. The thirdly thing is we ignored in the past biodiversity, both uh, natural as well as uh, agricultural. We have to bring that in now. And uh, you see, we, soil health was never a real major concern in watershed programs before. You need to look at soil health because unless you develop that in terms of increased organic content, you're not going to be able to improve the availability of soil moisture for crops and therefore even protecting crops against periods of dry spells. So apart from that, you need to move into environmentally friendly agriculture. It's no longer a fad. Methods that actually improve soil health not only increase agriculture productivity but also reduce the cost of production. So today, because of the market nexus, you need to not only improve productivity, you need to reduce drastically the cost of producing that same amount. That's where the farmer can make surpluses. So yes, today you need to, to do things not only the same way as was done in the past, but also differently with new components. Now with regard to sustainability, some of the pictures I showed you there were actually closed down. That means the project had ended as much as 12 to 13 years ago. They're still going strong. The point is this. People, if, if you do a thing right with the people themselves doing it in which they've invested their own contribution, then they tend to own up to what was done and they protect it. But they will not protect it because they did something. They'll protect it because what they've done is directly improving their yields and their incomes. So they need to see the direct link between what was done and what they're benefiting now. If that link is broken, However much they may agree with what has been done, it's unlikely they will invest the effort, the time, and the energy in protecting it, number one. Number two, it's very important that children who, you know, that's the reality, that intergenerational issues, that unless people have gone through hardships and worked their way out of it, and that experience is transmitted to succeeding generations, it is not likely that what was achieved will necessarily be continued by succeeding generations. They need to be exposed and reminded of where they've come from and the importance of securing and protecting what they, they, they are, they have, their parents or ancestors have achieved in order for them to invest in continuing it and developing it further. And lastly, of course, one must also be open to the fact that many of the changes that take place externally, either to political changes or whatever, is not in our control. So we have to always keep reinventing things drawing upon the past but adding new things and evolving and changing to accommodate new situations and pressures. There is no such thing as sustainability which is frozen in time. It's a constantly evolving concept, even though it builds on the past and quite strongly so.